We are excited to welcome back two great friends of the show, David Berry and Frank Nestle. Thank you once again for joining us. It's a pleasure to host you both once again. Frank, can you share a brief personal intro with us? Yeah, first, Drew, a uh, pleasure to be here. It's, it's uh, the second round, so I really enjoy the BIOS podcast, uh, truly informative uh, source uh, of uh, great things in AI and beyond. Uh, my name is Frank Nestle. I'm the uh, Global Head of Research and CSO at Sanofi. At Sanofi, we're really providing medicines and vaccines to millions of people across the globe. And I started off in 2016 as foundational therapeutic area head in immunology research with now 15 medicines in development and moved in my current role as CSO about 2.5 years ago. Now, from a background, I'm a clinician. I'm a scientist trained in dermatology and clinical immunology, allergology, but I've been always driven by the quest to make a difference to patients by understanding disease mechanisms and translating those insights into therapeutics. And ultimately, you know, the ultimate quest is to precisely tailor these therapeutics to individual patients or patient populations. From a science perspective, I was fascinated by the immune system from the early beginning of my scientific career. If you think about the immune system, uh, billions of cells circulating in our blood, providing a connection between the tissues and uh, surveillance protections from pathogens and cancers. But if it gets out of control, it can cause autoimmunity. But then at the turn of the century, the human genome began uh, to reveal its, its power and its secrets. And I became fascinated by the impact of the genetic architecture on, on how the immune system either leads to homeostasis or pathology in, in, uh, 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 in, in human tissues. And this is where data science comes in because data were exploding and the classical statistical thinking of normally distributed data t-tests uh, were not kind of fulfilling uh, the answers, uh, providing the answers to the hypothesis I had. And, and that brought me into data sciences. And all of this comes together with the ultimate quest to make a difference to patients and the curiosity to unravel disease causality and turning insights uh, derived from that into potentially medicines. Of course, thank you for the, the wonderful reintroduction. Uh, Frank, it's amazing to have you back on. Uh, David, can we, can we ask for a brief intro on yourself as well? Sure, well, happy to, and and thanks again for the opportunity to uh, to be here to come back. Um, so, brief background on me: uh, so I'm MD PhD by training, MD from Harvard PhD from MIT in biological engineering. Uh, I started a couple of companies while I was in school, and so I ended up becoming a um, phenomenal disappointment to my mother by uh, never practicing clinical medicine, and ended up joining um, flagship pioneering. And I've spent 17 years with flagship helping to ask big what if questions and building a series of companies that we think can help to usher in cutting edge, next generation, if you will, technologies, all founded upon um, an open mind and foundational questions. Now, a couple of years ago, driven by some insights around what I'll call our aspirations to make medicines truly programmable. And what I mean by that is as you look at some of the biggest companies and innovations that have come before us, how we've gone from the traditional small molecule development with some of the insights we generated around um, the central dogma, that is how genes make proteins. Of course, we've saw the development of companies like Genentech and whatnot that ushered in biotechnology as a phenomenally important part of the drug discovery and development ecosystem. More recently, of course, with companies like Moderna, the ability to translate some of these insights much more directly into therapeutics becomes incredibly powerful. And we've lived that all, uh, all up front and personally over the last couple of years. But what we've now been seeing is that some of what's becoming available from a computational standpoint, from a data standpoint, and I don't believe you can separate those two, is this aspiration to truly make drug discovery and development programmable from end to end. Now, obviously we're not there today, but we founded Valo Health about three and a half years ago with exactly that aspiration. So I've been running that company for the last three and a half years and have had the great privilege of working with uh, over a hundred people on bringing together everything <laughs> from the preclinical to the translational to the clinical components under a single integrated um, discovery and development engine or OPAL computational platform. 
Fantastic introduction. Can't wait to hold our further conversation here and dive into our first topic. Uh, and so as we began with your fantastic intros, I mean, you have covered both your storied paths um, that have led you to the forefront of AI within precision medicine um, and bio from two very different approaches is what we're so excited to bring forward with this conversation. Um, from, from each of your podcasts previously covering your work, we, we're excited to have you both back on the show to continue on this conversation from another lens. I really be our, our round table to debate the future of AI within bio. Uh, but before we dive in here, we would love to uh, set some good grounding context uh, for our audience. Uh, maybe, Frank, you could start. Could you tell us more about the evolution of AI within biopharma? Uh, maybe if you could divulge uh, the, the short but storied history from your perspective. Yeah, it's actually an interesting question. And uh, in biopharma, actually, already in the 80s, 90s, uh, there was a discipline which is called computer-assisted drug design, which essentially takes advantage of molecular modeling, insights, data analysis, and pattern recognition. And the goal is to predict protein structures and analyze large data sets. So that started already at that time. And then with the Human Genome Project at the turn of the century, as I said, you know, big data came to scientists everywhere who were interested in, in, in human biology and the, the connection between genetics and uh, how the human immune system and how overall human pathology plays out. But I guess from a from an AI perspective, it was uh, in in about 2012 when uh, Geoff Hinton and uh, and a few brave scientists uh, cracked uh, the the code for establishing neural networks and and really turned uh, the classical machine learning approach, which was essentially a, a a world of classification, to a world of prediction and learning. Um, and and now we call this generative AI and, and the rest is history. And, and that opened up a whole new opportunity of applying AI to, for example, precision medicine questions, we're probably going to discuss that, but also to molecular design and, and really getting into these hockey stick moments where, where learning and DMTA processes allow you uh, in a combination with great data sets and neural networks to build completely new hypothetical frameworks, uh, new thought uh, uh, contexts, and and create new insights. It's amazing here from your perspective, Frank. Uh, David, would you would you care to add anything? Sure. I mean, I think when we when we look at where some of where AI has been and where it's going, I mean, I, I, it's easy to say we're at the tip of the iceberg. Um, but one of the things that I'm 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 very excited about is, as, for example, as I went through. Uh, clinical medicine, we all learn this same or hopefully same tome of insight that allows us to translate symptomatology into diagnosis and allows doctors to do whatever it is that they're enabled to do at any given point for any given disease to try to make patients have the best outcomes possible. But when you think about what a doctor is doing, right, they're trained on about 2,000 plus or minus mostly subjective variables that they're using what I'll call the human form of artificial intelligence, otherwise known as intelligence, um, to come up with that diagnosis. And, and it's done a really good job and it's created a great foundation. The challenge with it though, of course, is these are all subjective, they're all correlative, and they're all built off best practices. Now, where we sit today with the data that's available today, is we can already start converting that basis to replace those 2,000 subjective variables with 200,000 quantitative variables. That gives us an opportunity to redefine disease based on what the data is telling us. Now, just that simple comparison, I think, is a really powerful one because often the question is, well, why? Because the 2,000 are pretty good and the diagnoses today are pretty good and the insights you get even from the 200,000 many times are the same. But what we start finding out is that in some cases, you find very meaningful differences that allow you to start understanding the onset of disease, the maintenance of disease in very different ways. And that these are cohorts that you really wanna follow, manage and treat in, in different ways. And this speaks to the power of what AI does, which it allows us to operate at a mathematical, a statistical and insight scale that exceeds the way the human brain works. Said a different way, and I mean this with all due respect, when you talk to some of the best chief medical officers of pharma companies, what they'll say is, for example, they'll bring in, as a program gets, gets brought into their organization, 30, 40 major streams of information. And when you really press them on how they do what they do, really what they're doing 
is they are coalescing down to three driver variables, not the same ones every time, but three driver variables that they base their clinical designs off of. And, and when you think about it, that is what a statistical machine does. These chief medical officers have really good statistical machines. And the more that we can automate those insights, which we can by learning from large, large numbers, just in the same way that these chief medical officers can, the more we can augment our capabilities because ultimately, when we look back at the history of drug discovery and development, right, 1,500 odd uh, drugs have, have been brought forward from insight to approval over the history of the FDA, you know, but we're also dealing with 13,000 diseases. And I think to be able to get to the scale that we ultimately want to achieve, we need to enable all of the drug discovery and development universe to be able to do that much more. And just by bringing together this kind of statistical insight, I think allows us to have just a different level of potential impact. And that to me is really exciting because I think we're getting to that threshold where we're starting to see those insights become highly, highly actionable. Yeah, David, can I come into this uh, a great example? Because it, it resonates a lot. If you think about the human brain as a prediction machinery, uh, creating what's called human intelligence, then it's probably uh, fed with about 2,000 parameters. You know, if you're, if you're a medical doctor, if, if, you're, if you're a dual scale of the profession, it's probably 5,000 parameters. But what we do is then we actually assemble multiple brains. Uh, I would call it crowd intelligence to then when we are on rounds or when we make decisions in committees, we bring in these different brains together and, and we probably compute then together. If we are 10 of us, we then compute 50,000 parameters. But imagine you go now to machine intelligence, to artificial intelligence, and all of a sudden you compute like what JetGPT is, is doing in, in its version three, uh, 175 billion parameters. Um, and what can you achieve if you compute those and create novel hypotheses and insights and, and create reasoning machine, which you can then actually have a conversation with. And when you have a conversation with the other side, uh, with that machine intelligence, you actually get to a higher level of insight too. So, so I, I think that's what the, the real um, power is of, of that new world we're entering, that intelligence and intelligent insights become so abundant that it allows us to get to a whole new level of insights and, and discoveries. And, and I'm just going to build on one particular point that, that you had, Frank, which was that, you know, one of the things that I've always found when starting companies is the one thing you don't want to tell other people when you're keeping everything secret and confidential in that hush hush world of the super secret stealth startup um, is that a problem is solvable because that turns out to be one of the most powerful pieces of information. And this is one of the things that AI helps to break down, which is now we can start seeing at much larger scales problems that are solvable that we didn't previously know to be solvable. Once you know it to be solvable, the ability to put mental power to it and come up with whether it's the right solution or an alternative solution or any number of solutions becomes that much more accelerated. Yeah. Of course. I mean, it. I think that's a, an amazing ground set for where we are in AI today, how it compares to current standard of care. And just tying those threads together, it, it really ties a fantastic picture to what the current state of the industry is. So I really appreciate it from you both. To continue this conversation a little further, um, I, I think we we discussed briefly some of the applications that AI has already enabled. But um, Frank, we, we'd love to hear this, uh, directly from you if you would want to start. Uh, you know, what what have we achieved thus far? Uh, what, what have been some of the greatest applications um, that have been enabled by AI that we're seeing in the current industry today? I will keep it brief because uh, yeah, I could go on for the rest of the hour. But um, if I if I see two major areas of uh, contribution and, and progress, one is precision medicine. It's this quest of precisely tailoring our therapeutics to molecularly defined patient subsets and doing this in a safe and effective way. Uh, and there are two um, main areas uh, within precision medicine where AI really has transformed what we're doing. One is, uh, what is the key question for the industry is, how do you get to new mechanism and new targets? And we are building now orthogonal target ID engines using AI with literally millions of data points, integrating everything from genetics, genomics, single cell, 
approaches and a lot of other orthogonal data sets to, to get us to that point that we're understanding patient biology better and understanding what are potential novel mechanisms and first in class targets. But then on the other hand, we can also use this information to repurpose drugs. So if we have a, a drug and one we know its molecular mechanism, we can put it into new patient populations or, or new patient subsets. So there's a lot of opportunity in precision medicine, but in between, between finding a great target and then applying it to a patient population, you have to first design that, that drug. And, and in that um, design space, there's also an incredible opportunity for navigating, for example, a chemical space we were never able to, to navigate. If you, if you think about it, the potential chemical space of a small molecule is about 10 to 60. And, and this is uh, close to uh, the number of atoms in the, in the universe. And typically with a screening approach, we would have 100,000 molecules screened. 100,000 versus potentially billions and, and trillions of molecules and more you, you, you could screen. And, and what we can do now with artificial intelligence, we can, by a virtual screening approaches, um, explore that massive space. But what we can also do is we can then optimize molecules. It's, it's not good enough if you find a hit. You have to make it drug-like. Uh, and you make it drug-like by optimizing features like oral absorption or excretion. And, and all of those uh, features can be optimized by uh, artificial intelligence approaches. So a lot to uh, learn both in the precision medicine, but, but also in the uh, molecular design space from AI-empowered models. Of course, Frank, thank you so much for the overview. Um, to, to flip it over to David for a minute here, what are some of the current challenges in life sciences related to AI? Um, and maybe David, as a, as a continuation question as well, um, are, are the challenges different for biotech companies versus pharmaceutical companies uh, from, from your perspective? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think there's, there's a bunch of different layers to your question, Drew. And let me try to uh, dissect it out a little bit. So I'd say one, there's a general set of challenges that any AI company or even portions of a company that are dealing with AI have to deal with. And that's that AI gets viewed as a black box. Um, and that just creates a show me challenge, right? And the challenge that we have in drug discovery and development is the time scale of show me and the substance of show me is not short, right? And it's expensive. And, and so if you think about it, right? the more people resist the desire to use AI and why? Because with AI, for any number of different reasons, there's always this fear that the goal is to eliminate jobs, right? The goal of AI is not to do that. It's to actually accelerate our development. We are so far from this point of being in a maximally efficient industry that's converting every insight overnight into a drug, right? And this is an industry that I think has been because of the guardrails that are up to protect human safety, that is going to have to have very important um, rules and regulations that go in at every sector. And that's great and that's important. But I think once we can get some of that, like replace jobs out of our mind, then we can start asking some of these questions. Because just going back, if I wanna prove statistically that AI or an AI component is doing a better job, how many phase two clinical readouts does one actually need to believe it on a statistical basis? And if you're a small company and you want to do it one by one, right, it's going to take a few generations. Um, that's not going to work. If you're a pharma company, it's going to take a big portion of budget. And then you're stuck with this, um, um, you're stuck with this sort of chicken egg problem of how do you convince yourself to spend that capital? So I think this is one of those questions of how do we get proof points? How do we get people comfortable with it? And of course, on one hand, the shorthand is we talk about explainable AI, where we can start pointing to mechanisms and output. But I think also what we're starting to see, and Frank was alluding to this, is there are portions of the drug discovery and development cascade where we're starting to see insights that are actionable, that are tangible, and the timelines of them and the cost points of them are so quickly becoming transformative that it opens up the potential for AI to have a real impact. And that's something that's really exciting to me. Um, the chemistry side, for example, being one example where I think um, we've we've all seen these design make test cycles that have historically been depending on where one grows up can be months right and with some of these ai companies now being able to see um timelines that i'll put it 
is this way, substantially shorter than that. And in certain cases, days. Um, uh, but also doing that at the same time while exploring massively more space, but making many fewer molecules. And these are very measurable substrates. So I think that happens to be a, an important area. Another area that's really important, frankly, is bias. Um, now, unfortunately, bias can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But the data that's captured is the data that's captured. And you know, we hear a lot of this in the context of GPT that the um, that the data it's trained on is the data that it's trained on and that helps to generate its insights. And that's the internet. And the internet has its uh, frameworks for what data looks like, thus biasing some of the outputs. Well, when we look at data that we have in the context of um, human data, where has more data been captured? It hasn't been captured evenly across the world. Um, it hasn't been e captured evenly across types. Um, there are certain types of data that are newer. There are certain types of data that are older. All of these create different forms of bias. Now, bias isn't intrinsically something um, that is uh, something you have to run away from or um, but at the same time, what you have to do is you have to acknowledge what the biases are because they bias your output. And I think this is one of those areas where that's always been a challenge. Um, uh, it always will be a challenge. It's not going to go away. And I think it's one that you just have to be very cognizant of as you're building your insights, but also figuring out what to do with them. Thanks so much, David, for that level set there. I think it leads us into our, our next topic here, uh, really surrounding AI and drug development itself. Uh, so really just what excites me about our conversation today are your difference in perspective, yet your shared North Star of therapeutic impact. So one of the biggest approaches that we really want to turn our focus on to is the AI's implications within drug discovery and development itself. Uh, but as we think of that shared North Star I was discussing, I mean, we'd love to use the opportunity on this roundtable as a way to come together and uh, discuss the similarities, uh, differences, and applications within AI and drug development. Um, so, Frank, potentially just to start here, to, to level step, um, where are we today in drug discovery and how has AI influenced this? I mean, better yet, shaved off years off the process today, as David may have been mentioning. Well, maybe I, I follow up with what, what David said. One of the, the problems with our industry is that uh, we're required to provide proof points. But the proof points take time. Uh, so, for example, if you if you look at what's currently in the clinic, as so-called AI designed drugs, uh, you know, if I look at them, they're just first generation. And uh, we recently had a failure, for example, from one of the companies uh, with a target where I would say, you know, do you really need AI to uh, come up with that molecule? Um, so there's a, there's a, a it, it takes some time to to get to these proof points. But overall, if you think about um, if you think about the drug discovery process as an assembly line where you start with a, a discovery of a, a hopefully first in class drug target um, then you make a tool compound then you have uh, a few hundred attributes to optimize to ultimately make this a potent and specific compound you then optimize safety um, you optimize then the path into clinical translation to a, a patient population and then you run your clinical trial each of these distinct processes are amenable to prediction. And they're amenable to prediction, especially if you're sitting on large data sets um, like you know, uh, pharma sits on. And what's the interesting, um, uh, I guess, ultimately North Star, what, what AI is going to deliver is that it's going to change the economics based on predicting what is the right molecule, what is the, what is the safety uh, feature, um, you know, what is the right indication? And all of that has a potential impact on the two factors which determine the economics of, of pharma. And this is cycle times and probability of success. Cycle times have been stubbornly stable for the last um, 20 years. If you look how long it takes to get a compound into the clinic, it's four or five years. Uh, and probability of success has been also uh, stubborn. And what we're also already seeing now in the engines of, of the drug uh, discovery industry is that in the engine room, we can shift these cycle times. We can, for example, synthesize less molecules to come up with a, a clinical candidate. We can make this faster. 
uh, we can increase our probability of hitting the right patient populations. All of that has the potential to change the economics of the industry. It's not there yet because we always look in a rearview mirror. But if you're in the engine room, you see that a lot is going on. Of course, uh, to really continue down one thread uh, you were discussing, uh, David, if you wanted to add comments here, as technology and AI progresses, I mean, how, how do you view AI scaling drug development over time? Yeah, so let me let me touch on a couple of different um, a couple of different pieces of this, um, because I think it, Frank was touching on some very important pieces that of of the length of time and some of the recalcitrance um, uh, that that we've been seeing of being able to change the the probability of success, the cost of drug discovery and development, um, the timelines, et cetera. I mean, so you know, part of the way we at Valo have been approaching things is we've been taking a slightly different lens and, and, you know, whether or not this is going to, this is going to prove to be impactful, obviously time will tell, right. And I don't want to get too far over the tips of our skis, but drug discovery and development has historically been a highly siloed uh, industry. And the challenge on that is it's created data silos and operational silos. And one of the things that we see as an opportunity for, and of course, this isn't something that um, we're the only ones who can do, uh, is that we can use data and computation to unify how, if you will, data is used across all of the steps, how insights are used across the steps, how data is shared across the steps. Um, and we think that that in its own right will increase probability of success, will, will help to reduce time, will help to reduce cost. And, and I say it relatively simply because, you know, usually when I say that, the first thing is, well, how does a clinician use ADME data, right? Uh, or how does a med chemist use, um, use clinical data, right? And, and the reality is what that's just done is found, it just found two examples that actually reinforce the, the siloing nature because it actually turns out these data, these data sets are very important to one another because when you make a molecule, ultimately it goes into a person. And understanding everything that that molecule can bind is really important to being able to understand its probability of hitting the intended target, its probability of hitting unintended targets, whether good or bad, and being able to predict what those outcomes might be. Are we there where we can actually do all of those predictions with 100% conviction? Absolutely not, right? But when we start realizing that all of these, this integration of data can be incredibly powerful every step of the journey, I think what we start to see is first that sharing, I think will get us exponentially more powerful insights. And I think that's something that's incredibly exciting. Second, as we can start bringing forward those insights, clinical insights that go very, very early on preclinically, even understanding what the clinical trial design is as we're developing our targets, right? And validating our targets. What this will ultimately do is just making sure we're highly directed, which isn't to say people are undirected, but it were highly directed towards getting outputs on goal. And I think if nothing else, that aligns a North Star. And if nothing else, it allows us to get to fail experiments faster. And that's always been a difficult component. Now, when we're talking about increasing probability of success getting to fail, it's probably not the goal, but reducing spend on these late stage trials that, don't, that aren't gonna work, obviously we'd all like to be able to do and focus those resources on things that we think have a higher probability of success. And that's why we think a lot about data integration and what I'll call silo integration, because we think that's what it will ultimately enable as we as we progress some, down some of those paths. Um, you know, I think when you when you look at um, you know a, a given stage and trying to prove out some of the proof points of um, what's going to be able to make something uh, what's going to be able to make something successful. Uh, I mean, I think part of what we're also ultimately trying to do is kind of align on what are those proof points that we ultimately need to see? And the reason I put it that way, right? You can look at data that's been published by, by others, you know, the, the, the organization Bio, for example. And if you read its reports, right, it says very clearly that if you have a biomarker, right, you increase your probability of success by 25%. If you have a genetically defined disease, you can increase your probability of success by two to three fold, right? And so there, all of a sudden, we've got a map. Right. But the challenge on this is that's taken, what, two, three decades to be able to generate that data. And, you know, I don't think the message anyone's going to take from that is, oh, let's go develop all of our drugs 
for those specific subsets, because then we'd be giving up treatments for cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, you know, things along those lines. But it is building that roadmap for us of sets of things that we like to see. It's just, I think what we need to do is figure out how we get those proof points faster and in highly compelling ways. Couldn't agree more, David. Um, and to continue down the the thread that both of y'all covered briefly, but I'd love to ask directly, uh, Frank, if you wanted to start here, um, what do you view in, in your vision as the ultimate realization of, of AI within drug development and discovery? Well, uh, uh, the ultimate realization, that's a, a, a big question. And I would like to come back to uh, what David called the what if questions. And I, I give you two what if questions. And I think they are uh, in the realm of possibilities AI will, will be delivering. And the first question would be, what if we don't have to immunize a single rodent or mouse, or in our case, llama, to make an antibody? Um, because we can essentially take a target, uh, we can predict its protein structure, we can predict its epitope, we can predict how an, an antibody or nanobody will have to be produced in a size and shape that it binds to a certain epitope, that we can predict the stability, the expression of that nanobody uh, in a, um, a given cell line, that we can predict the anti-drug antibody uh, properties of, of an antibody or a nanobody, uh, and, and that we ultimately can predict what we would love to know at the stage that we move a, a molecule into the clinic, and what if we could all do this virtually? And, and I think that's in the, in the realm of uh, what, what AI uh, can or will deliver in the future. Now, I have to say that the, the, the space you have to navigate to predict an antibody structure is even more complex than a small molecule. So, you know, you have to do this with a, a, a high degree of being humble and, and hopefully uh, with a view that chance uh, pr uh, favors the prepared. But the other what if question is, what if uh, we can uh, approve a, 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 a drug, uh, a safe and effective drug in, a, in a, a, a certain indication without running a single clinical trial? Um, and that comes back to this opportunity of creating virtual patient engines or digital twins. Uh, at, at this moment in time, we're using quantitative systems pharmacology. We're probably using about 100 parameters. We're predicting first in human dose. We do already a lot of predictive modeling, but we still have to run, for example, in atopic dermatitis, 3,000 patient uh, clinical trials to ultimately get us to that conviction that we have a, a safe and effective drug. What if we could, we could um, completely change that game and and reduce the number of patients uh, we have to put on a, on a clinical trial? What if uh, we could then shorten the cycle times of getting from a phase one to a trial to an ultimate approval? So those are those are the types of North Stars, and uh, they're not going to happen uh, uh, with, a, with a five year plan uh, and with certain timeframes. But what we've been seeing is that there's a lot of, lot of hockey stick moments uh, if you apply some of these predictive tools, uh, if you get the right uh, data, if you have the right computational power, um, it's fair game to say that some of these what-if questions are in the realm of at least um, being achieved uh, over, over the next 10 years or so. Fantastic to hear. Uh, David, any, any additions before we continue on? I mean, I think Frank said it. I think Frank said it incredibly well. I mean, I think, you know, as we're as we're looking forward towards some of the some of the progress. I mean, we can we can imagine what this this uh, this future is going to look like. Um, I mean, at the risk of being facetious, I don't think any of us are thinking there's a moment where you kind of say you type in a disease and the computer spits out bleep blorp bleep blorp, and all of a sudden there's an FDA approved drug on the other end. I mean, I think what we're what we want to do is make sure that we're accelerating the um, uh, kind of ability to generate rational, high confidence scientific insights as fast as we can and and make sure that we're keeping the same kind of rigid scientific and ethical standards as we continue to develop uh, continue to develop drugs. But ultimately, what these tools allow us to do is think differently around what the patterns, what the paths, um, what potentially the approval regimens can ultimately look like. because ultimately, I mean, we're all in this for this goal of better drugs for patients faster. And the more that we can use these tools to enable it, 
then I think the more we all feel like we're winning, we're all feeding this common good. And I think that's the thing that drives us and excites us. Of course. Um, I want to touch on, I mean, again, the same North Star of therapeutic impact there, David. Um, I think a large portion of each of your previous episodes uh, with you both, you individually stressed the importance of data uh, within healthcare, within the side of AI. Um, with the importance of data sets becoming ever more important, especially um, after a discussion regarding drug development, discovery, uh, and, and all of it that feeds in, um, Frank, if you potentially wanted to start, what, what are good data sets that enable bio from your perspectives? Yeah, first, if you think about the trinity you need to be successful with AI, it's about compute, uh, the computational power you have, it's about the algorithms, uh, and and then the data sets you, you apply. And if you think about computing power, Moore's law, uh, we're going to see maybe even hockey sticks there with so, some of the quantum computing applications. On the algorithm side, um, a lot of the, at least until, up to now, a lot of the um, key algorithms uh, are open source and are available to anybody. If you, if you want to do a, 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 a transformer-based uh, 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 you know, deep neural network and, and, and run that, it's, it's available to, to anybody. Uh, what's really differentiating is, is the data sets and, uh, and the high quality data sets and their accessibility. And um, what's absolutely important is that these data sets have unique identifiers that uh, they subscribe to a common language you can extract, that they have the right labels, um, that you have a, a foundational uh, data architecture in place. Uh, that these data are findable if you need them, that they're accessible, that they they operate across uh, multiple analytical platforms, and 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 that they're retrievable. So so there is a, a whole range of um, uh, requirements to create uh, the optimal data set. And and uh, if if we look at uh, pharma, uh, large pharma companies, they sit on incredible uh, treasure chests of. Um, of, of data and and what 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 we need to do now is to to get that foundational element right and often uh, if you're rewarded with KPIs um, uh, which are not necessarily in the foundational space then that's not what uh, where, where typically the resourcing goes so there needs to be a a, a, a mindset shift uh, in addition to a culture shift and and getting the right talents in that it's these data foundation and the investment for the future, which will ultimately empower this field. Incredibly well said, Frank. Uh, David, to continue this perspective, how can we build trust and design proper data sets uh, that would enable this industry as a, as a continuation here? Drew, it's a, it's a fantastically important question. Let me just say one thing first, which is, you know, when we were raising, for example, our, um, our $300 million Series B, um, we got asked the question very often, are you a data company? Are you an algorithm company? Are you a computing company? And our answer was yes, because ultimately, <laughs> as Frank said, you can't separate those. If you want to do this, you need to have all of them. And I think it's an it's a very important component of, of what we're doing. But that being said, to your point, Drew, you also need the right data. You need quality data. You need relevant data. You need representative data. And we are of the belief that some of this data exists and some of it needs to be generated. And I think as we think about um, where some of the data sets are and where they're going, um, look, on one level, uh, it's easy to say, hey, we should have a data commons and uh, bring all the data together and whatnot. Um, I think the reality is, as we look at what the progress of some of these computational tools are and the way that they're accelerating, just looking at even, for example, the delta between GPT-3 and GPT-4, um, the data commons may, may even self-sort itself in a very short period of time. And I think that's going to be incredibly powerful. Um, there's implications to that, which also, again, means the more you're integrating into the insights for drug discovery and development, the more relevant and the more impactful that ultimately you think you can be. Um, at the same time, I think there are areas where we have known holes in the data, right? Do we have sufficient cohorts of well-developed multiomics? I think we'd all love to see a lot more of that. Um, I think the challenge on it is it's really expensive. And, and so what we end up seeing are piecemeal cohorts that exist uh, from uh, disease to disease with certain degrees of 
continuity certain degrees where there's lacking longitudinal data associated. Um, and it just, it creates challenges. And I think this is one of those areas where uh, I think we're going to see continued progress there. Uh, we're going to see continued investment in those areas because frankly, I just described a problem set that could occupy a handful of pharma companies for several years if they wanted to put all their capital there. Um, but obviously they have ongoing day-to-day -day businesses like developing drugs and um, and whatnot. And so I look at that as a really, really important area that the more that we're collectively pushing there, the more insights we're going to glean. Couldn't agree more. I mean, just to continue this conversation, I I'd love to hear from you, Frank, on this side. Um, David, I think, covered a fantastic overview of where we are in the state and how this is evolving. But to ask in, in, in finality some of the some of the bigger questions, Frank, to ask you a big one again. I mean, how, how should we view the, the future of data uh, within bio it, itself as a whole? Well, the future of data within bio will be determined by how well we built the foundations. It's it's a bit like these wonderful buildings you have uh, you see in the back of my the screen here. Uh, you have to get the foundations right, um, but it's not all about the foundations of the data and how accessible they are and how well they are generated. It's also about on the other on the other side who is going to analyze the data. It's going to be about the talents, the ambidextrous biologists and data scientists who are going to analyze these data sets. It's going to be about society and how society values data and the regulatory and policy framework around data. It's going to be about data privacy. It's going to be about data security. It's going to be about a, a multi-dimensional uh, network of, of, of key contributing factors, which will determine the success or failure of a, of a data and knowledge driven society. So we're, we're on this journey and uh, we're on this journey together. Um, I, I, I said at a, a recent dinner, um, what if uh, uh, intelligence becomes commoditized. Um, what if uh, uh, all all these data are then then uh, are going to contribute to a, a big reasoning machinery where uh, the human brain is 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 just being a commoditized function? Um, so there's a lot you can speculate and think about, but but let's start first with uh, the 101 and the base camp, which is create the data foundations. It's amazing to see from your perspective. Um, it just to just to pivot here, David Frank. I, I mean, I would love to take us into a section um, to continue on this trends and prediction side of through a, a rapid fire lens that we do. Um, and, and so, just to ask a few rapid fire questions here, uh, Frank, if you wanted to continue the conversation, I, I'd love to hear from your perspective. Um, what, what do you think are the the most common misconceptions within AI and biotech? Well, David already alluded to some of them. Uh, right. The first one would be don't expect to have immediate proof points if you're, if you're working in the biopharmaceutical industry. Uh, it takes time uh, still. Uh, the second one, the second misconception is AI provides accurate results. No, it doesn't. It generates testable hypotheses. Sometimes it hallucinates, uh, but it's always something you need to iterate on. And uh, ideally you iterate on with uh, uh, a human intelligent uh, 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 organism on the, on the other side. And then the final one, and I think also David touched on that, AI is not a one size fits all solution. It's not like you, you type whatever problem you have and molecule you want uh, and in the indication you want to crack into a computer and out comes the perfect solution. It needs this, um, uh, it needs two elements. One is conversation uh, with a human and creation uh, and ultimately the experimental validation uh, to make it work. David, any, any continuations, additions there? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to build on one one particular point that Frank said, which is that um, I mean, AI is not a um, it's not a it's not a one stop shop. Um, AI is a big sort of field transforming component, but it is a massive substrate that's being built. I mean, it's almost like using the word transportation. Um, so you could say, hey, I want to get from New York to San Francisco by transportation. And it means one thing to go by plane, and it needs means another thing to go by bicycle. Um, and and I think this is this is the 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 notion of what we have to recognize is yes, AI can and will be applied across every phase of drug discovery and development, and I expect it to have meaningful impact puts uh, and impacts. And what it's going to ultimately do, I think, is lead to these benefits of 
faster, lower cost, higher probability of success. But the impact and the shape and the insights are going to have nuances driven by the algorithms in each of the uh, in each of the steps. And I think this is really important. And it's also one of these things where um, as we the more and more we understand it, the more we have to recognize that the human machine interface is incredibly powerful here. There may be one day where these machines are massively outstripping some of the capabilities of what humans are able to do for drug discovery and development across the, if you will, development ecosystem. But look, just as a, as a simple example, yes, they can think in much higher dimensionality for chemistry, but they don't have uh, highly productive interactions with regulators. And uh, I think this is going to be one of those things where we have to recognize what, is, what does it actually mean to bring a drug from insight all the way through approval and well, I think what we all want to do is accomplish these same goals, the steps along that journey are many, they are important, and they have to be appropriately managed, safeguarded with the appropriate um, intent to make sure we're getting high confidence insights as we're putting things into people um, that obviously, if not done right, have deleterious effects. Thank you again, Frank and David. As we come to our final section, I'd love to take a moment to discuss the future of the space. Really, just to, to start briefly here, uh, what what does the world look like when we are able to completely integrate AI into medicine? Um, David, potentially, w- would you want to start here? Well, first, I mean, I'll share a little bit about what we think about at Valo, and there's a reason that our logo is a circle, which is we believe that you should understand the entirety of the life cycle from the beginning of your drug discovery and development journey. And then every step you make, you should feed into the information, not just for that drug discovery and development campaign, but the next one, the next one, and the next one. And it becomes this consistent and constant learning machine. And and so we believe that as the field is progressing, as AI becomes a bigger and more impactful part of drug discovery and development, we'll be able to understand, if you will, the human condition, the human diseases that we're looking at, find these causal targets, find the maintenance targets, find the essential places that we need to act, but we're doing it in ways where we have high confidence on it. We can simulate the clinical trial before we even make the molecule. We can make the molecule, obviously with much higher confidence, with many fewer failures. We can predict the impact of that molecule, layer that on top of the, if you will, the target simulation, thus predicting translation. And effectively through a lot of that, you're coming up with ways where you're ultimately predicting the clinical trials. Again, are we there net today? No. But I think if we rolled back the clock 10 years, right, we'd be talking about targets like KRAS as being undruggable. And I think we've been seeing that change a little bit. And it's one of those, that happens to be one of these dynamics where um, we still have a lot of, quote, undruggable targets until they're druggable. We have a lot of unsimulatable things until they're simulatable. And the challenge that we deal with, I hate to put it into vernacular, um, but when we pick words like undoable, right, it creates a mindset that these are unsolvable problems. The reality is they're not yet solved. And this is what we're starting to see is this step function transformation of the ability to solve important problems. And I think that's going to be where we're continuing to push um, and push at paces that are much faster than many of us think. Frank, just to turn the question to you, um, what do you really see as as the world that is, I mean, completely integrated within AI and into medicine itself? I mean, from your perspective, potentially, you know, when when will we know we've kind of won in this space? It's fully realized. Yeah, it's a good question, and you know, you can uh, open your the aperture and and look uh, pretty broadly. And if you look beyond biopharma, where we talked about precision medicine, uh, you know totally transforming that space, precisely tailoring very targeted drugs to to patients who are waiting, Um, changing the way how we run clinical trials uh, with a um, a, a remote patient monitoring and and telemedicine approach uh, where we're doing clinical trials in a a way that they are decentralized and that patients can actually stay at home when when you do a clinical trial to ultimately improving diagnostics. Uh, uh, if you think about that, uh, the origin of the first success stories in AI were in computer vision and um, medical imaging pathology is, is uh, a- as we speak, completely disrupted. Um, for example, we work with a partner, Okin, who is a, a master in ex- uh, running AI algorithms on H&E slides. These are these 
sections which are stained with a, a blue and a red color. And you can actually extract now genomic information from uh, a, a slide, which is um, a tissue slide, which a uh, section which is just stained with a, a blue and a, a red color, uh, truly amazing. But then also overall in the clinical decision-making uh, space, we discussed at the beginning how a, a doctor is probably trained on 2000 or uh, maybe 5000 uh, different parameters and, and that uh, leads to a decision-making process. Now, if we, if we uh, do this now at scale um, uh, with a machine intelligence coming to the rescue, this can completely change how we, um, how we do um, medicine in the future. But I'll give you a concrete example. You were asking from one. We're working with Dina Katabi at MIT on uh, a, a, a system which essentially is a wireless router and that wireless router can remote measure its scratch behavior actually next door through a wall, like your wireless router can send magnetic signals. Um, so I, I imagine a world where these types of digitally um, uh, 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 parameters, these digital parameters are then used for clinical decision makings that they can provide regulatory endpoints and that they ultimately can guide physician patient interactions in a remote manner so that, for example, you could say, uh, I predict atopic dermatitis is going to break out uh, in your body and I have a medicine to disease intercept. I don't have to wait until I see the disease to treat you. Of course. Uh, thank you both for, for, for joining us. It's been a fantastic discussion. Really wish we had more time to go through more topics here. Uh, but I, I want to close it up and ensure we kind of have time to wrap things up here nicely. Um, Frank, if, if you wanted to start as we're closing up this episode, any other closing thoughts in review of, of this episode or discussion that you'd like to share? I mean, from your perspective, it's Sanofi, um, views on AI. I mean, anything to, to close this episode out? Yeah, thank you very much. You really enjoyed that, especially also in that conversation with David. So two, two AIs, three AIs through human intelligence uh, machines coming together here uh, in, a, in a wonderful way. I have to say, I've personally been fortunate to witness the, the massive impact of com the computer revolution, internet revolution, but certainly AI has, has the potential to create another major transformational moment for progress in our society. But at the same time, uh, we need to establish the rules of engagement to ensure that benefits outweigh the risk. And one important point we have not mentioned yet equity is is that everyone can enjoy those benefits no matter where they live or how much money they have. Um, so the bottom line is the age of AI has started. The train has left the station. You can't put it back, uh, uh, but it's filled with numerous opportunities, but also responsibilities. I think it's an amazing way to cap the episode. Uh, David, any additions, closing thoughts from your perspective? First, uh, Drew, thank you for the opportunity to be here and it was, it's been great chatting with you and with Frank. Um, you know, I think when I, what I'm most excited about is we've opened up a new era. There's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of um, things that we get to think about, but ultimately the thing I'm most inspired about is I think there's now an opportunity to have a drug for every disease. And the more that we can progress around that as a framework, I think that's going to be an incredibly enabling feature for us as an industry. And while obviously there's challenges that come up with it as well, um, it's something that I think is a great calling for me. Uh, it's something that inspires me and something I, I personally am uh, quite driven with the intent to uh, to deliver. Could not think of a better way to close the episode. Uh, Frank and David, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. I really appreciate your time and, and hope you enjoyed the episode and our, our time with you as much as, as much as we did. Thank you, Drew. Bye, David. Bye.